can best relate to the rest of the world. When you examine the structure of the Vinci economy, you will notice it's a very small one. When you hear some great stuff, you think that this is the biggest economy in the world. Yes, we have done well over the years. There's no doubt about that. But one is a kind of way. Barbados, in the context of the global economy, is like a drop of water in the ocean. That is recognized that. How, uh, whatever measure you use to assess the size of Barbados, whether right? it's population size, whether it's not the land area, what the size are we talking about? It's a small place. As Kofi Annan said, it's a small country that should survive some its level. And I like it that way. And that is why I became concerned about the, what I call the gambling strategies, which I hear polluting the airwaves from time to time. <laughs> Small economies like Barbados have one advantage. It's the advantage of being insignificant in, the, in global affairs. If you can call that an advantage. When you're small, the disciplinary economics has not yet incorporated the role of power in arriving at decision making. But all of us know that power is an important, it's an important factor in determining outcomes when you're dealing with small and large nations. So we have to understand that we start off in Barbados with all the challenges within the smallness. Because we're small, we don't have a diverse natural resource base. Large countries tend to benefit, tend to be blessed with a far more diverse resource base, precious minerals and so on and so forth, than small states. Also in the context of small countries like Barbados, the per capita overhead cost of administration is higher than in larger countries because you can spread your overhead costs over larger populations. Perhaps if there's an advantage in managing these small economies, it has to be found. The small societies tend to be more coherent and governable. So we start with that limitation of small society. But the second fundamental quality to do is a high degree openness. Openness. In December, at the end of December 2011, uh, the ratio of retaining imports to our gross domestic product at market prices was 38%. If you compute that, the United States, I don't think be in double digits. Or China. And Brazil is rapidly approaching that type of status. Those economies are almost self-sufficient economies. Because they can produce almost everything for themselves. So when you have an economy like that, you can always implement a stimulus program, I'm going to get that later. Because 
we have some new school of economists, I, I, I don't know where it is. <laughs> when you were that open, the first problem you have to treat with as a government is how do you insulate your economy and the quality of life of your people from adverse exogenous shocks, that is, disturbances, adverse disturbances originating in the rest of the world. That's the first challenge you have. I want to say that in the context of Barbados, we have very limited capacity to protect ourselves against these adverse shocks. But if you have an intelligent population, you know what I say, intelligent? You don't have that lot of school in the media, you have born intelligence. <laughs> I know my old man, she never studied Latin or French, nor Spanish, but when I took my report to her, she knew a tip on X. <laughs> See, those, that generation had uncommon common sense. <laughs> what worries me today is that too often the bachelor's degree, which is awarded to many of our people, are no more than decorations. Because they come into university and they leave untouched in terms of the mental capacity to analyze issues. That is something which is worrying me about what I'm seeing today. So we open. <coughs> and the best protection we have in terms of dealing, protecting ourselves against adverse external influences is by education to develop an intelligent populace. That's our best effects. Not the more people do to say, I'm mean, alright. If somebody makes an offer to you and it's too good to be true, it can't be true. <laughs> and you find a lot of people with long enough let us be behind their names. Don't understand that. You think of it. But in addition to openness, we are very dependent. We are dependent in a structural sense. What happens in our economy? Responds, responds to what is happening in the rest of the world. So we're structurally independent. Institutionally independent. If you look at our banking system, our commercial banking system, to the best of my knowledge, there is no commercial bank in Barbados that we can say is a Barbadian bank. Like you said so many years ago. I knew we had a post office in this bank. Then that was developed into the Barbados National Bank and we suffered the indignity of having a national bank owned by the residents of another country. I have my own views on that. There's no consensus within the economics which are discipline on it. But it's my contention that one thing the National Bank did for this country, it acted as a countervailing force to the practices of banks who were headquartered in North America. And it goes further. And as you check the facts, 
There is in the public domain today information which denies former Prime Minister Sandy for his Jew. I can tell you. Prime Minister Sandifer in 1992 removed the non-performing show that from the portfolio of the Barbados National Bank and put it in the Agricultural Credit Trust. At the same time, he created the Barbados Agricultural Management Company to manage the indebted sugar plantations. And the surplus income which accrued from the management of those in debt plantations was allocated to paying down the debt. Shortly after the debt was removed, the bank became profitable. This notion that somebody other than Sanford fixed the bank is without foundation. I have to tell you. I am convinced that when objective historians write, address the record, the economic record of Barbados in the 1990s, Sandiford is the one look at the prince. I can tell you why now, and I have the whole for later. After Barrow, Sandiford is the only leader who attempted to restructure this economy. In addition to restructuring the agricultural sector, he saw to the, to the, to the, the implementation of a social partnership which is celebrated across the world. He set up that national productivity concept. He reduced the, 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 the um, size of the public service subcomponent in order to reduce is clean on the current resources of the country, or the government. I invite you to do some thinking and find out what happened with those restructured initiatives. I know Marin knows very well what happened with some of them. If I went to look at that structure last uh, Friday, I'm very pleased to see what is it. Happening today, I hope that I will be able to come over there to the opening when it is done. <laughs> All I want to say to you, I think it is important to give a man his due. You don't have to, 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 um, to, to be in love with somebody to give that person their due. And uh, I say this, I have no need to put right next to somebody. A man who suffered so much needs to be given his due before he dies. Mm. Remember, in 1993, Barbados joined the World Trade Organization. I have something to say about that later. I better advance it and say it now. <laughs> And that World Trade Organization, on paper, is committed to the rolling map of to the rolling map of barriers to free trade, as well as because it's a rules-based organization, it is on paper supposed to ensure fairness between small nations and large nations. As I say on paper. I want to say if you look at the record, if you are small, that 
Fear next is an elusive dream in that organization. Just think of the struggle, the continuing struggles of the governments, successive governments of Antigua and Barbuda, who took the United States to the dispute tribunal, won the, the case, and to this day they're waiting to get into it. It reminds me of Barbados in 1984, 85, 86. That was the situation with Seven Stephen Sun. There were many people in Barbados walking around. They let us saying they would get some money. But not one cent was in that fund. Seven Stephen for sure. Between 84 and 86. I wish the better from that administration was in office, you would know. Mm -hmm. So I'm all going to recognize that the rhetoric is one thing, the reality is never when you're small. And I'm telling you why when you're small, you have to be very careful. Antigua or Barbados taking matter to the dispute tribunals <coughs> of the WTO will never be able to pay for the specialized legal services which you need to fight that case. I'm sure the attorneys of law in this room recognize this. In one case, you will find a whole range of legal scholarship which the big countries will assemble. And you will bring a country like Barbados to bring one person to fight the case. That person lost. I mean, you get swamped before, before you start. And then an appeal, appeal to resurrection monitor. If we, as a small country, decided we do not like the price of the products, and we decided to boycott, boycott trade and the products, nobody will miss us. <laughs> you have to understand that. Nobody will miss you. So I have a way of saying that the sole advantage, if you can call it advantage, shared by the small countries in national trade is their insignificance. And that is one of the issues which this government has been grappling with since 2008. Nobody in Barbados could do anything to disrupt the global financial and economic architecture. I swear because something there in my mind that I wouldn't say. But Nobody operates the law within the law today. <laughs> when I look at the economic structure of our country, what do we see? We see basically two categories of economic activities. The trading goods sector 
which comprise, tourism, dark services, sugar, and non sugar, and manufacturing. Of course, you know, tourism is the key there. In 2011, tourism earnings are completely developed. 30 39% of total foreign exchange earnings, that is. And that is the direct impact. I'm not talking about indirect. Reach around tourism because you have to, if you talk what you're talking about, you have to add in what the taxi men are making, what the world sportsmen are making, and, and all those um, spin off activities. So you have a trade good sector which basically has tourism, sugar, and we know what the situation in sugar to be. Every time you produce a big loss, non sugar. I made a comment this morning on that television. Uh, this time you'll come as we end. I express my concern about the control of the distributed sector in Barbados. Because if you control the distributed sector, you can effectively determine what is distributed. See that more. On the other hand, you find the non trade sectors, and I've explained this significance between the two just now. I'm sure some of you understand today. The non trade sectors distribution, construction, mining and quarry. Transport and communication, electricity, gas, water, government services, government is a pretty substantial part of our GDP, and other basic services. The fundamental distinction between the non trade sectors and the, sorry, between the traded sectors and the non trade sectors is that the trading sectors provide the foreign exchange earnings for our country. And that given the structure of the economy, the non-trade sectors which use foreign exchange have to depend on what is happening to the trading sectors. Anything that impacts adversely on the trade sectors has repercussions for the non-trade sectors. Want you to bear in mind. <coughs> so anytime you see a major downturn in tourism, any time to fuel expansion, to inject more money, more spending into the non-trade sectors that is unsustainable. It is unsustainable. In much debate about that in Barbados. And I don't know why it's being debated. Because it's fundamental. <coughs> Let us think about the composition of total expenditure in Barbados. That is expenditure by, by Households, expenditure by businesses, and expenditure by government. We call that aggregate expenditure. Let us disaggregate it and examine the composition. If we look at households by expenditure, you will see that we're hardly producing anything for ourselves. Where do non durable goods? I see my friend, Christine, the very 
special shirt that is that is not, not, not made in Barbados. <laughs> I don't know, see, you know, but I, I say that <laughs> and I mean it. It has a certain significance for this country. So the non the non jewelable goods, including food, we have import about six hundred million dollars in our uh, food and beverages every year. If you move away from the Durable, not durable. You think about the durable goods, the automobiles, household equipment, the television sets, and you can go on. They're all imported. If you move to the intermediate inputs which go into production, the fertilizer and agriculture, Oh my God, I lose my son, but you know we don't make them every year. The input coefficient in the area of production of fan of fan goods. We talk about we have sufficient import tree. Have you ever thought about the import content? The poultry, the medicines, the hatching eggs. I don't know if the eggs are uh, uh, produced in Barbados. The, the material for the pens, the feeding staff. We talk, yes, we say we have self sufficient, but that's how the import content in the self sufficient we are. So I said also, it's make the point. That even at the level of intermediate inputs, this is important. The input content is high. I say all that to say to you that foreign exchange is the vital resource which determines what we can do in this country. When foreign exchange inflows start the trial. And you don't take a fresh car in this country, the country will collapse. It will collapse. And will collapse a small country like Barbados will collapse very quickly. People who have big capital, access to big capital, are fools. They now have to protect themselves. So if you get a government which is gambling, those guys know how to get the money for the country. So, in that situation, a prudent government or a government assures risky strategies. Well, they did not have to that just now. The point I want to make that is that Foreign exchange is a point which was made recently by Dr. Lightburn's government. <coughs> foreign exchange is the life of our economy. It's as simple as that. The more, the greater your capacity to earn it, the greater is the ease with which you can borrow. Spending, domestic spending. I suggest that in the case, for example.
I want to deal first with the irrelevance of a big push stimulus in our economy to deal with the current situation. China can do it successfully. Japan can do it. The United States can do it. And succeed. If Brazil needed it, it could do it and succeed. But if we do it, we are stimulating other people's economies and we are putting ourselves up to risk of the jeopardy. Because as we stimulate other people's economies to ban their goods, we don't produce the, the incremental spending which is going to flow from the new expenditure and employment of people. They will spend the money. But the money is going to be spent on imported commodities. So your imports cover, your farm reserve imports cover. <coughs> it's going to be challenged. But you have to, that is a basic reality. And these are not things that we should play political games with. I was, in a, I was uh, in, involved in a radio program. We sent you bread, I must say. The suggestion was thrown in that the government could implement a bigger stimulus because the commercial banks that have foreign reserves too. And the commercial banking system will finance some of the activities using the foreign reserves. I study commercial, I study banking. I got my master's thesis. And what I learned then? is that in this part of the world, commercial banks, particularly those in their offices in the metropolitan countries, they tend to be risk averse. They are risk averse. And notice, they prefer to lend short term and make loans which are self liquidating. Sure, by the time you make a loan, it turns over a number of things. Let me give you an example. If you have an automobile business and you want to import a consignment of vehicles, you go to the bank if you're a good Sunday and they lend you money to bring those vehicles out to pay the interest on that. When the vehicles come in and you want to pay them, you go back and get that money. And when you sell them, when you sell them the clientele they go and bomb in for the system too. So that that's a safe type of loan. They like that. If you know this, if you can set up a business, I'm going to take a heavy belly. That's the lap room. And if you're not careful, and mindful, once you pay back a loan, if you don't request your collateral, Later, when you want it, mm -hmm. you have to get legal counsel. You have to see to get it, so you have to pay. Yeah. I'm a true experience here, so I don't know. <coughs> but things are that much small, I don't know whether I know, so I didn't argue too much about it. I want to say to you, you don't have to be conscious on this that that bankers. would not have been this very long if they recognized that the government of a country was pursuing risky strategies and they would come and take the foreign reserves or have holdings of our foreign policy. The bank of that strategy? If the economy collapses, the banks had no, they had no money to buy the, buy the uh, Incumbent properties. 
and the bank is not in business, in some of the business of auctioneering, it's going to let you do it. So this notion from this guy from claims to be claims to be somehow somehow You suffer from devaluation fatigue. <laughs> Same thing happened in Ghana. I remember visiting Ghana for the first time in 1968. It was a lovely country. And we used to enjoy coming over in the uh, around of that big, uh, big uh, hotel. It was built up on Green Heart. They got the subway fire some years ago. And we got married young ladies riding the bicycles because they Main um, in Georgetown, means a uh, transport in Georgetown as a bicycle. I know riding that exercise, you got to see all the legs. <laughs> so this girl's got strong looking for legs. <laughs> it's not a normal environment. Because <laughs> everything right that environment. But the dad is not there. <laughs> you see, at that time, I was married already, so I couldn't go and get in trouble. <laughs> But I want to say to you that God forbid, what is the violation of setting in our babies? You can reach the bed. I'm not probably saying anything because I don't want to prophesy. What we would get 
is a continuing round of devaluations. Look at Suriname. In 1968, the exchange rate of the Barbadian Gary Sultan was identical. Two to one US. What is it today? One, a hundred Gary Sultan's exchange to one Barbadian dollar. I had the dubious experience or pleasure of going to Glen but I think it was in the late 70s, early 80s. I mean, I just, just got off the plane and I was sitting about my age. I made a mistake and changed around to another day. Go back. It's the first time my life was embarrassed with money. I never come to it. What money gave me because the biggest denomination I have is a $20 note. I begged for two big broken bags. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it like And every maid that came to my room, I gave him a half for the gift. I said, no, get it. I'm talking about the destruction of a country. And Ghana has a potential for development that our parents will never have. The fundamental difference between our parents and Ghana, this country has been less time to time. The vision I lead you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just think of the Democratic Republic of Congo. I know no country that has the range, that's in dealt with the range of precious metals as that country. Ever since the death of murder rather. For Baptist to Mongo, the country has been made unstable to the civil war. <coughs> and that's the war is financed by money power to keep the place unstable and no government can exert its authority. And therefore, they can take out the military and continue very cheap work. But the Barbados is going in there, so why are you going to try to destabilize Barbados? Our main asset of the leaders has been the industry of all people. That's this morning when we have said. <laughs> my mother's generation and my mother's generation, they would work hard in a brutal system. Many ages. But it's on their backs that that the water harbor Hospital was built. If you go back and do a study of wages with rates in Barbados, we go in line. I did that. I tried to do that uh, somewhere in the early 1970s. When I saw the wages I was working for, I wonder how do you raise the families? The part would be very industrious. So I want you to be clear. The fixed exchange rate policy which the government of Barbados adopted on the nation of Alabama on the 5th of July 1975, that is the linchpin of economic policy in Barbados. <laughs> all our economic policies are articulated around that fixed exchange rate. If that is disrupted, it is going to disrupt everything in the country. And therefore we have to understand that there are certain conditions that must be recognized and adhered to if we are going to defend that exchange rate. We have to make sure we are competitive. 
If they're not competitive, they're going to lose on age in our tourism markets. We're going to lose on age even in the few areas of Barbados where they're producing. So we have to think in terms of what are appropriate income policies. Uh, when I talk about incomes, I mean all fat incomes. Rents, profits, wages and salaries. <coughs> all fat incomes. A lot of people I talk to me, you hear stock on income policies, think you mean uh, the people who work for wages. No. I am talking about income policy which covers the whole gamut of our incomes. <laughs> so, I want to say to you now, I'm not talking to the converted, I hope, so, that we must never tolerate a government or someone, some party that wishes to form the government who is articulating, the leader of the party is articulating policies which we know are risky. Retired persons in particular have to make sure that that does not happen. Because when you reach my stage and busy stage, we are not going back to work. <laughs> I have no intention of going back to work. I will do what I want to do and if you like. <laughs> what is the fact? The retired community have every reason to be more on guard against risky strategies than young people. Of course, young people have to be concerned about it because the life chances can be impaired. And we have to guard against those fellows who speak from different sides of the mouth. <laughs> you got a lot of that. So, all I'm saying is be on guard. Now I want to emphasize that one of the weaknesses in our society is the void, the just of a void with respect to programs of continuing public education that set out to sensitize ordinary men and women in Barbados to the workings of our economy. You don't have to go to university to understand the basics of workings of our economy. I said to you earlier, if this economy is going to be robust in its performance, two things have to be happening. It must have it must be able to earn for an exchange in a sustained manner. And believe me, when that is happening in Barbados, the markets in which we get our tourists, those economies are very robust. Canada, United States of America provides a short term business. United Kingdom, major source of long-term visitors. Germany and other parts of Europe. And Eastern Caribbean and Trinidad wants the partners, trading partners in the North Atlantic are doing well. Our tourism be doing well. You may not know, but Visitors out of the out of the CSM region, right, very highly 
in terms of buying toys and services in Madrid. So you don't have to understand your economics. When all trading partners are doing well, you check the history of it. We do well. When they're doing badly, we do badly. I have always say when this needs, we get to go. And if we fall hard, if they are not doing well, for us to recognize that we have to try and understand whether it's a passing phase or whether as we're going through now, they still have to hang inside there for the long haul. I'm going to share some information with you shortly. I know that I uh, made this fraction work on me. was first on us. There was a talk about the sun glow. But we had a discussion. <coughs> discussion about Colleagues. And I was the one man left out on a lid. I didn't mind. I, I said, no, I didn't really sing them those I think that this thing is a very deep structural crisis. Wherever you find that you have a recession which is caused. In short, put it this way there, which causes some people in, in um, North America and Europe to lose as much as a billion dollars at one shop in investments. It is bound to impact on people's attitudes to spending going forward. So all these people are talking about when these economies are bound to My guess is you can see more conservative attitudes to spending. But I go for that the time I say, I think this, this uh, challenge we are facing is going much more protracted than what we're accustomed to. And I remember my good friend and colleague, Professor Howard, he said, I don't agree with you. But at least he's decent man. He came back and he said, right, you know, I agree with you. I, I didn't think, I didn't share everything at first, but you're right. What I would say is that, uh, that advice would give to anybody in a policy position. The last thing you must do is commit to a strategy unless you understand the evidence. If you don't have the evidence, try again. But don't commit to a strategy and then find that what you do, what you've done, you be shooting from there. It doesn't make sense. And it's dangerous. So I think we have to pay great attention to public education and values. I must tell you, something disturbed me within the last couple of days. Somewhat said to me, but in Barbados, there's a trend in recent times where some people are saying, I don't want to use them on Greece, on Spain. I want you what's happening in Barbados. Now, let me tell you what I'm saying. I realize that what is happening is that there's some people who are suffering from fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> They've lost jobs for a long time, and in spite of trying to re-enter the workforce, it's not working for them. The young people who are in the secondary school, on the application, on the application, Nothing is happening for them. As well as some people go to university and they get frustrated at the time. I'll address that problem later as it does I come to the end. Because I think that government has to design a strategy to help those vulnerable groups to return a balanced approach in terms of looking at these issues. Because it's certainly a very bad, unbalanced approach. If you are saying you're not interested in what is happening in the economy, what is happening in Germany, 
what is talking about the United States and Canada. It means by extension you're not interested in what's happening about it either. Because under those economies start to show strength in a sustained manner. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. So I think that we have to do something about it. And I also want to say to you, I have learned that political assurances that the currency will not be devalued are not to be taken seriously unless the government of the day is putting in place appropriate policies and strategies to work. My experience is following these kinds of issues over many years. I never trust the finance minister who would say, I'm not going to Who would say to the country, I will never do this. You know why you don't trust him? If he say that? Because a finance minister is supposed to craft policies to deal with changing situations. There are times when you have to do things that you yourself preach about. But you know you have to do it. In the interest of the populace that go down the road. So I don't understand that. But let me see the policies in place, the policies you are pursuing. If you're telling me under your, under your leadership, they're saying it's you see. Remember how this crisis that you're talking about started? They started when Lehman Brothers, the fourth largest firm in the financial services sector in the United States of America, collapsed. When that collapsed, it undermined confidence in the financial sector so the entire world. Some countries are able to deal with it better than others. Canada, for example, is able to deal with it well because their banking system is well regulated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well regulated. That's why they're able to deal with it better. In the United States, all of us know what happened. We don't have to go over that. Peer number. Predecessor in office to uh, the President Clinton. It was like, no, not President Clinton, the successor of President Clinton. Yeah, peer for peer, peer education. I have a lot of sympathy with President Bush. <laughs> I honestly think he was ambushed by some of those others. But he was covered late. Because when late, in the late stages of his second term, he was keeping fellows at arm's length. But recognize that the economic and social challenges we face go right back to the misdeeds that took place in metropolitan country, in the financial sector of metropolitan. Could you imagine that some firms in the financial sector were offering products for sale and were betting that these products would fail? That is documented. The US government is now pursuing lots of them in the courts. You are selling a product and you're betting it fail? And could you imagine that there were certain institutions with big names, international names, who were giving the same firms a glass rating? <coughs> That's a fact. But there was a conflict of interest. 
because those sums were earning the money from the consultancy fees paid by the same firms. That's why I'm a healthy disrespect. For <laughs> <laughs> some of these people who travel around small developing countries, yeah. as experts, want to tell the countries what to do with their populations. And the only reason they're experts is because they're far away from home and they have a ticket to travel. <laughs> I remember I had a professor, a very distinguished professor, the late, the late George Lacey Fitzgerald Beck Beckford, a very smart brother man. And I remember in 19, I think it was 67 or 68, he was my supervisor of research. Ford Foundation was conducting a consultancy in Jamaica to recommend how Jamaica's archaeology could be transformed at high level. Um, the consultant knew nothing about Jamaica. If you know Gillette, Gillette was a real doctor. I mean, he was consulted every morning, as soon as his office was open, he's actually asking him what to write. I cannot tell you what Gillette said in front of me. <laughs> I, I can't repeat it. But he used very strong language, muscular language. <laughs> I thought he was going to invoke all the questions I started. I said, God, we just say it in a way that he said that way was aggressive. <laughs> Look, we the answer was so thing there that we read the report and gave it like a lot back. And he did it. Jim Ben wrote the report and gave it to him. He didn't ask for a second. That was the kind of man Givet was. He would have given his life for Jamaica and the rest of his career. Notice that very rapidly after the onset of this disruption in the financial system, how rapidly the effects were transmitted to these small countries. It didn't take long. Very quickly by these small countries. And one of the reasons why they were transmitted so rapidly is that we are fully integrated into the global economic system. We were fully integrated, fully integrated, because there was a time when, and Darcy will be familiar with it since he was a banker, you could use certain instruments to block the movement of money and so on. Nowadays you can move billions of dollars in, in, in seconds. You have a crash in Indonesia in the late 80s. If you take over like billions of dollars are moved. In 19, many rebellions in the 1930s took place in the Caribbean. The great I don't call it great because there's nothing great about that depression. People thought about the Great Depression. It was a very destructive <coughs> depression. That had an impact on the Caribbean too. And it was a positive impact. Because it was a proximate cause for the rebellions that took place in the Caribbean at that time. I know some people like call them rest, but one of rest. A rebel is a Louis Mont, a rebellion as a leader in a program. And to the best of my knowledge, the, what we saw in the Caribbean were rebellions. You see, it was Carmel and England called a rebellion. But in the Caribbean, many people like me, better, they say we're writers. I have passed the stage. The one I want to say is that no government in Madrid since 
I think in 51, we got adult franchise. No government has had to grapple with an issue of this magnitude. It seems to be the law of the Democratic Party. <laughs> and I look back and I see the times when the Democratic Party comes to government. I remember 86. And I look back from 2008. But not a single government going back to the days of Nancy Adams has ever had to deal with a problem of this magnitude. Not one. Say about the, the attitude of the situation is that we must try and push back the frontiers of ignorance. That is why I try <coughs> I try trains to participate in public debate. Which means public education. Because an ignorant populace is a dangerous populace. Now, government's response is to this challenge. I want to look at those two. I want to call the first thing government. Access to foreign change. I don't know a single person who's going to refuse access to foreign change in that case. Nor do I know that there's anybody who's paying to get who's paying a rate above the rate set by the central bank to get access to foreign change. And you want to tell me that's not a major achievement? <laughs> Again, and I'm about to say, if you ever find yourselves repeating what the enemy says, they know you don't want to know. <laughs> you have to understand it's a major achievement that small country like Barbados is able to defend its exchange rate. So, what the opponent will say, they will keep shifting the goalposts. What are we talking about that now? We talk about something else. <laughs> But if you, as a city, have not done all your achievements, what have you got to have? <laughs> so I think that the first achievement which you are, you are as a government needs to understand. In the most difficult of circumstances ever in this country, certainly since 1950, government, nobody is saying, they want to buy the ill and they want to get a particular job and they can't get it. Nobody said the hospital will have the job to do it. It's a lot of politics. I haven't heard that yet. You go to supermarkets and shares of stock. Mm -hmm. So when I hear these things, I check carefully to see who's saying them. We had a honeymoon shortly before this problem broke. We had two honeymoons. 
Ministry. You know how that money was around 1996? When the rock was introduced. I want you to go back and check the record. The bank generated a massive fiscal reform. Massive fiscal reform. And it went through this economy like a dose of salt. I'm serious. I mean, Sandy for the only hard work. Life is, life is fine. Sandy for the only hard work. The overseeing and fashion of that plan. You know the official man, so and so. Ever heard that saying? It is the irony of life. You took all the hard work, and you were treated as a commoner. Now, the first thing that happened in Barbados. <laughs> Almost immediately, uh, when this crisis broke, all those large capital inflows, private capital inflows, that were coming into this country in the late 1990s and certainly until about 2006, they dried up. Remittances came to trickle. The principal enterprise in the trades good sector contracted and government had to be looking for money to support them. Government had to be giving a deferments of such like payments, like NS and so on, without interest penalties and so on. Government had to find more money the marketing, push the marketing. I heard a charge against the Minister of Tourism that he was paying, he advised the government to pay subsidies to enhance it. I don't expect to hear a different story coming from that side. But the point I'm making is that in a time when government revenue, real revenue was contracting, what was I say real revenue? Because $10 today is not worth $10 the next 10 years. $10 today, if you if you ask me to lend you ten dollars and you can pay back in ten years' time, I am going to get the cost to pay the debts and work out what you should pay me. Right? That's the minimum you should pay me. And we also charge something else for loss of opportunity. Because if I had my money and a, and a good investor came along, I could get into it. But since I don't have that, you got to compensate. Leave that down. So all of those things put government in a bind. Revenue, real revenue, as well as nominal revenue was in, in um, falling until government decided to increase the value. I know government likes to take away allowances from anybody. Government, a full of government only do that to protect people from themselves. Because you can leave them the money and they might be worse off. Because government is not able to continue to carry that, that, that ballooning fiscal deficit on current income. There's a lot of talk about that fiscal deficit and getting just now. <laughs> So when the government came down with the medium term response, medium term strategy, and I'm about to talk about what is the government doing 
with respect to growing the economy. What do we in search start to do? It's present a holistic approach to the reposition of this economy. Go and read the study. It's available to anybody who wants to read it. For the first time, which not government focus on increasing capacity of this economy for an uptake by the private sector. Now, for example, creating opportunities for the private sector. And I mentioned what I consider to be very important, the pension paid to the management and development of water resources in this country. My best information is that 60% of all water pump in this country, certainly up to about two years ago, could not be accounted for. It burst me and so on. But it's not only water we're losing, it is the cost of power. The cost of power we're losing. So I am particularly pleased to see attention paid to water resources management and development. Because Barbados is ranked among the most water scarce countries in the world. And you can't have a sustainable tourism if you don't have sustainable supplies of water. Also, to you, it makes for better management of agriculture. You just can't rely on being fed agriculture. So the evidence is there, everybody is key. Also to that development strategy addresses the issue of the environment, the green of the economy. So what I'm, what I'm, I'm saying is a holistic approach to repositioning the economy. What I want to suggest to the one is that where the tension should be paid to the issue of alternative energy. How do we get different income classes to buy into alternative energy? I'll tell you why. I know about the index for energy. And in the last three or four years, that index has increased by almost 200 points, 200 uh, basis points. So uh, from about 103, there's about 200 links like somewhere. That's the latest information I checked two, like, two or three nights ago. And food has to be in situation. Because the prognosis of food grains is not good. We've had bad harvests in the main producing centers across the world. So they can anticipate the products of food grains and feed and serve. Then the price is going to continue to accelerate. It has nothing to do with what's happening in the And the issue of debt consolidation addresses that issue. I know there's a lot of talk in Barbados about the unsustainable fiscal deficit on credit account. And let's move to our next one. Now, let me say to you that you can't just jump to the conclusion as the right strategy of dealing with a recession. In the last thirty years or so, we've had different origins of recessions. More often than not, it was a case of market corrections. Over speculation of markets, on a bubble and then you get correction. All of us know of 9 11. That generally the downturn as well. And that's why it's acts of terror. This is the first time since the 1930s that we've had a recession which is caused by systemic failure. 
that is a breakdown in the system. Do you know this? Uh, I have a chance to leave. I draw an analogy between economic and financial system failure and the clash of tectonic plates. You know, the tectonic plates keep the earth in the same position. When those plates clash, you get an earthquake. And that is the analogy which I draw. That, that break in the system, that fracture in the system, in the system is a clash of those plates. And you know when you get a serious volcano, you know, terrible rupture in, in, our, in the system. So what we're dealing with is unfamiliar. And those persons who get it and suggest that they have the answers, just give it to me and I have the answers. I always question what is it up to. I want to say some things about the vexing subject, very vexed subject of high public indebtedness. I want to be crystal clear. There are two dimensions of it. There's much discussion about unsustainable deficits on the fiscal current account. A former leader of this party, well known a large off on this matter. Let me say that it is not difficult for me to understand why fiscal deficits of an unsustainable nature emerge in these times. If you adopt a strategy as a government, that you want to keep people in work, that strategy has a tendon cost. If you also have that strategy, that you have to find the money to support tourism because tourism pays the bills in the country. If you also at the same time employ strategies, you have to strengthen the safety nets to prevent vulnerable people from falling through the cracks. So, those things cost money. But inflows, outflows are increasing from your black, is it black box you carry? <laughs> outflows are increasing, inflows are plenty. The gap bound to be wide, So that, the notion that you can correct that deficit on current account and create fiscal space by some major things I talked about, privatization of public assets, um, revenues of public private sector partnerships and so on. I have one of the comments made about them just now. Now, I want you to go and take the time out and check get the annual system to digest what's by the central bank. And it's easy to get the information you want now because the world has opened up the database of the bank to all and sundry. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go to anybody in the central bank and ask the information. I stay at home and in the night. I'm in a pickle mouse. I can get the information I want. Do we tell you anything how to come here and ask all kinds of information? You don't have to do it now. I want you to look at something. Go and check the time series data for the public data database. And you'll find something. You'll find the main power was what over in 1976. This country had a Debt, I probably did that three, but if you make more, they have to check them. The period 1977, 1976, 76, to 1986, saw an 
acceleration in the rate of growth and death of the debt bordering on the exponential. Go and check it. I even want to point to you, point out to you that in the last 36 years of government in Barbados, the Democratic Party was in government for 13 years, and the other 23 years, what happened? What did the party? I've said enough that we don't understand that what you are seeing today in terms of the public debt, that trend was developing for quite some time. But what has happened at this stage is that the breakdown in the global financial system, with down impact, contraction impact on the Barbadian economy, it has unmasked, it has laid bare that particular weakness in the system. And it's laid bare at a time when we have to be done. But this is something that developed overnight. It was developed since 19, post 1976. Go and check the information and see it. And I know the former leader of this party was so long with us. It's real good. He wouldn't say that in a, in, a, in a debate with me. He would take a chance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I want to say to you about high quality indebtedness. There are few small tourism dependent countries, such as yourself, that don't have high public debts. And the reason is not far to find. Look at Gunsins and Vincent now. He was trying for some years to get to the National Airport. <coughs> so the infrastructure, which is necessary, if you really want to buy into tourism, you've got to find the money to pay for your modern international airport, for your deep water harbor. Make sure you have properly paved roads and you must be able to maintain them. You can pay sometimes the rent attractions. So then you yourself as a government, you have to invest in building that land. This happened in Barbados, it happened elsewhere. And you do it because you want to upgrade the, the, the standard of land in the country. And given the situation in the world today, sometimes you have to subsidize the airlines to make sure you get air lift and so on. And the other concessions which government will give. You give concessions to taxi men. You say after a certain number of years, you can change your vehicle to free because the government wishes to have a certain standard in the country when it comes to transportation of our business and so on. So governments in these towards small tourism dependent countries have got to step forward and find the money to do not the use in tourism is to rise to inequality five star in the country. Because it's the five star which has the greatest resilience. When you got five star properties in your destination. Even when the, the, the level properties are just surviving, the five stars have a final occupancy level. So it isn't that in these small countries of high high debt, high debtness. It isn't that this this, this reckless just has caused it. It is very effort to develop that has caused it. So I want you to, to follow carefully this talk about fiscal irresponsibility. I will in particular I'd like to talk about it. Now I want to say something, I believe I've said it before. There's a problem in my basic regarding governments like to come, or come to the office and leave their mark. <laughs> so to speak. 
And quite often, they tend to do it by introducing new social programs. <coughs> I have no difficulty with new social programs that are relevant to the time. But I think it's wise that before new social programs are introduced, a thorough audit of existing <coughs> programs should be conducted to discover if the justification for implementing those programs in the past still exists, and if it still exists, is it necessary to continue with them in this form? Because what can happen is that there will come a time when the economy is able to enable to carry those range of programs. That is the justification of the audit. I want to be very clear. I know the government has gotten a lot of criticism for summer school gardens and for um, bus race young people. But I think the government has an escape responsibility to rescue the young generation. I tell you, I. I was driving one day in the center. <laughs> I don't like to drive in there, but I had to wait very long for the transport of us. And the noise level was very high for the music. And the kind of music he was playing has not been taped. So I said, would you please do it? No, I was very sad to curse my body. I got off in Red Cabby and tell the Hastings, and I said, well, I don't want your mom out of fear. I didn't want to have anything to do with I took my decision then if I go walk the town, walk the town. I did not get it on the town. You have to protect the young people from that kind of culture. It is an investment, that's what it is. If you lose one generation of young people, it is a serious cost to the country. And I made the same argument about paying the bus fares for young children in school uniforms, driving in most of those salaries, particularly if open to school, destroys the mindset for learning. I would never, I shall know it, would never have a one of four children in those papers. I'm very concerned about this proposal to provide physical space through the privatization of the transport system. I'm very concerned about it. We have to go back and ask ourselves questions. How did the system get where it is today? Well, what can we do a check to see why God did that? It didn't get it done overnight. We had a properly functioning trans public transport system in this country after the concessionaires put out, remember the Rockling, the one in our city area. I don't remember the name of the people that were yellow buses yeah. and so on. We had a public functioning system. And the system could only have fallen apart through governmental action. So I'm saying the system is broken fixing. Because my concern is how are we going to minimize the clash between private and public interests? A private individual has different operations and different characteristics, which is very different from public decision making. When government makes a decision, it looks at social costs and social benefits. When a private individual makes a decision, it looks at what goes into his pockets, his or her pocket. Take, for example, I can come if the government plan allow me to do it. 
and establish a poultry farm in a residential area. But well, as the rain falls, you can't sleep. <laughs> that is a cost to you which I'm not bearing. Huh? The pain of interest is low to get away to do that. Because it's not paying the full cost of the operations. But you're bearing. You are the doctor with respiratory illnesses. You, you're home from work because you're not well. Your family, doctors, person who not done well. The family is under the stress, your friends are stressed because they don't know exactly what's wrong with you. You've got to keep no shut up. And if you keep no shut up, you can't keep up the false lines. So all I'm saying, we have to recognize that this dark fundamental clash between private and public interest. Because when you sit down to work out your returns, your bottom line, there are certain things you will take consideration. That's a fact. And it's a reality of life. So I think one of the things which we have to be sure about is that any government that wishes to privatize the system of the transport system presents a model which demonstrates you want to challenge them the extent to which they can minimize the loss and comfort caused through the privatization of that system. I'm not against privatization per se, I'm not against privatization per se, but all I'm saying is the first thing is the public interest must be protected. is that we have to make greater use of public-private sector partnerships. Again, we have to be cautious. Because the private sector might just buy into those which are profitable yes, and leave you holding the bag. Yes. What some of you are familiar with is the incidence of moral hazard. And then the dark spirits are left holding the bag. So those who will do these things, you have to question them and ask them to demonstrate how are you going to deal with these issues. Because at the end of the day, the dark spirit has to be. I want to suggest to you, in terms of this fiscal space, a lot of things are being thrown. My own experience tells me that the structure of the corporations need close, close examination in terms of accountability. I know you've had some structure of corporations in Barbados which did not present financial accounts to the minister for years and a couple of years. I know what I mean to that insurance. Uh, Quite some time. There were no statements submitted. No statements submitted. And we had to work. I got to do the work on it. And some statements to this day. We couldn't prove them because they didn't know. Certainly they didn't know. But I don't know to this day. What? Contributions would have been collected for different branches. And I think it had to do with the fact that it's a weak national system. You can't have an institution which is collecting quite a couple of hundreds of millions a year and you, and you didn't have a trained accountant there at the time. I remember when I asked, who is the accountant the system? says, the what? I couldn't believe it. When I asked, where is the opportunity to come back? To do what? Well, I know what happens absolutely do. So I think these structural corporations and government has got to take the management at all levels, particularly the CEOs of structural corporations, because the CEO sets the culture of the institution. Government has to take it seriously. And you have to raise the bar. 
with respect to the kind of people you are putting in management positions. I don't speak lightly on these matters. I have been a down sector in corporations since 1971. I've been around more than 40 years. My first chairmanship of the Saturday Corporation was in 1972. So you can see, 40 years ago, I was around that kind of business. And I am concerned about some cases, the quality of lack of, or lack of quality. And some of the persons who are put to lead those organizations. I want to say something about outlook for this economy. Less than two weeks ago, the governor sent you by Dr. Edward issued a statement on the economy during 2012. And he said at the time, that the performance of this economy was flat. And that seemed to set up a first storm in markets, calling programs for harm. I want to say something to you. That if, as a government, you cannot discover the truth and have the courage to say you disqualify yourself in a high office. <laughs> the political directory must know the truth. You are the policy makers. It is not a matter of telling you what you want to hear. You need to know the truth. So you must know what is it you're facing. I will tell you, I've been doing some reading on it since then. And because it's absolutely correct. Just let me draw your attention what the world economic situation and prospects are leading to UN publication. The one for the beginning of 2013. Have to say about the outlook. But what do you Four years after the eruption of the global financial crisis, and this is 2013, this is published, the world is still struggling to recover. During 2012, global economic growth has weakened further. A growing number of developed countries have fallen into double dip recession. Caught in the downward spiraling dynamics of high unemployment, weak aggregate demand, confounded by fiscal austerity, high public debt burdens, and financial sector fragility. And no, growth in the major developing countries and economies in transition has also decelerated notably, reflecting external vulnerabilities and domestic challenges I saw there. But it goes on to say, the prospects for the next two years continue to be challenging, fraught with major uncertainties and risks landing towards the downside. You know what that means when you say the downside, getting worse. And finally, it says, weaknesses in the major developed economies, the major developed, these are the industrial economies we're talking about, United States, Germany, France, and those economies, are at the root of continued global economic woes. Most of them, but particularly those in Europe, are tried into downward spiral as high unemployment continued deleveraging by firms and households, continued banking fragility, heightened sovereign risks, fiscal tightening and slow growth. That's the situation. Several European economies are already in recession. 
and Germany, one of the strongest economies in the entire world. Output has slowed significantly while France is stagnating. And this is a publication that is beyond it's a United Nations publication. You should get it in reading. Now, in this situation, in the major developed countries of the world, you could be some magician to come and tell me that you have real growth in this economy of substantial nature in the year just ended. If a governor had come to the public and said that, I am not like my no, no, no. <laughs> I am not like my friend. I get it. I'm ridiculing in public. I would never do that. But I would say to his bosses who have appointed him, it is time to let him go. <laughs> you have to be serious. The people who are policy makers in a country need to know the truth. <coughs> the, but the people at large need to know the truth as well. So I know how to plan. I want to say to you that from the most difficult situations, there are lessons we have to learn going forward. The lessons we have to learn going forward. The first lesson we have to understand is that people have a way of saying history repeats itself. I never accepted that. Because the times are different and the actors are different. So I go back. The first thing I want to say to you is that a study of recessions in the past is no guide as to how we should deal with it now. Because each recession has its own dynamic. The first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say to you is that during a time of national emergency, Timely presentation of information to the public is vital to the building of a national consensus. Because if ever we need a national consensus in Barbados, it's during the last four years and going forward. So we have to make sure that we keep contact with the people, let them know what is happening. It is absolutely necessary. And my advice is we have to get proactive people in the public sector. Do it. And if you can't find black people in the public sector, find people elsewhere within this country to do it. But that is absolutely essential. The item I want to say to you is that small economies like Marbellos can ill afford to squander their foreign exchange and resources through the person of risky strategies. This is not a time in Barbados to be gambling with people's fate. It's not the time. There is no time for it, but certainly this is about that if at all. We need to recognize that the failed sectors hold the key to sustain and really sustain sustain growth and development in Barbados. Consequently, governments have got to give maximum attention to enhance the competitiveness of those sectors, while at the same time focusing sharply on how they can deepen the activities of those sectors, deepening, for example, I would like to see more sandy lanes in tourism in this place. I would like to see that one which has been on the John Boards Road um, lower they were back strong. I would love to see that go up because it is good for Barbados. And that's what we call deepening in the, in the, in the tourism problem. As well as further diversification in our the structure of our, of our trading sectors. I also think that there's an urgent need to fine tune, and I know some very innovative work was done in the Ministry of Economic Affairs when Minister Sweet was there with respect to the construction 
of early morning systems. I think you should encourage further work on the refining of those systems. You know what shocked me is when the dean of central bankers in the world at the time, Alan Greenspan, when he was asked, what, did you see this collapse in the financial system coming? He said, no, I didn't see it. I saw that these fellows will protect themselves. That's what Alan Greenspan said. And he has all the research resources of any central bank of the world. He has all the technical resources available to him. And he confessed. He didn't see it coming. No. If in the United States, with all that technological support, the financial resources support the research, they didn't see it coming. You expect a good country like Barbados to be able to achieve what they haven't achieved. What we have to do well, we have to develop the one systems so they can track developments for a key, key what I call key determining factors, the variables that you know depend on the movement, direction of movement of those factors. You can say, look, we have to prepare for so and so and so and so. We have to pay more attention to that. And I know we have good young people in the public service who have the skills to do that. And I must be encouraged to do it. The, I also want to see great attention to public education programs. Programs that enhance the understanding of the ordinary man and woman about the structure, the workings of the of our economy. It's important for people to understand that the traded sectors in our economy determine the quality of life that we can live. It's very important for people to understand that. And I want a particular focus of these programs of the guys we have the target them. The youth. People don't leave in school. Whether it's a secondary level, whether it's a vocation level, or whether it's a tertiary level. And the reason I say that is uh, my experience is that lots of young people nowadays are visual. Not so much to say quite young read. When I was a youngster, there was no television. Uh, so you didn't have a distraction. But nowadays, youngsters have these gadgets and so on, and they fiddle with them. And uh, sometimes you have to lock them to get them to read. You lock away television. Or you now access to the gadgets and so on. Last thing I want to say is that I would like to see serious consideration given by governments to implementing performance budgeting in the subject corporations and in government to ensure that you get value for money. And the very last suggestion I want to make is not there. I would like to see the practice of evaluation of projects, evaluation of programs in project and ex post project. I would like to see more of that done in the public sector because the lessons of experience which you draw from those exercises will enable you to avoid making the same mistakes time and time again. I want to thank you.